my name is Christina Schaefer. I'm the social media manager for HAR. Um, I'm mostly here today to help uh, navigate this and, and get our panelists your questions, but I'm not the person you'll be hearing most from. We have Stefan Swanepoel and we have Bob Hale, two men that I think within the real estate industry need absolutely no introduction, <laughs> but I am going to just introduce them really quickly. Um, Bob Hale, our president and CEO of the Houston Association of Realtors, he has been a uh, he has been in that position since 1988. Uh, Bob's vision and drive had made, have made HAR.com a household name in the Houston area. Uh, HAR.com is the most frequently visited website in Houston, in Houston real estate and the only local website to rank among the most top 10 most visited real estate sites in the country. Uh, HAR has grown to be the largest trade association in Houston and the second largest realtor association in the country, so amazing. Um, and Stefan Swanepoel. Stefan has written over 50 books and reports analyzing residential real estate industry. He is widely recognized as the leading visionary in our industry and is specifically known for the annual Swanepoel Trends Report, the Danger Report, and the Real Estate Almanac. His books have been featured on 18 bestseller lists, including the New York Times, Amazon, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Stefan is chairman and CEO of T360, the leading research and management consulting uh, in the, excuse me, consult, consultancy in the residential real estate industry. Uh, and what we are here to hear about are insights on how to thrive in the new environment. So that is what Bob and Stefan will be talking about today. As we go through, if you have any questions, type them in. Um, Bob is going to be asking Stefan a lot of questions uh, and, and we'll have time for Q&A towards the end. So type those in and we'll get to them as we can. Uh, Stefan and Bob, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thanks, Christina. Uh, Stefan, uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to have you share your insight with members of the Houston Association of Realtors. I've known you since, I guess, what, the early 90s. And um, we've, we've been down a lot of paths together, and I've always looked up to you as truly a visionary in the industry. So uh, are we, are we going to see us or just the slides? Good morning, Bob, and good morning, Houston. What an honor to be with you guys. You guys, are, you guys are awesome. And Bob, you have been around such a long time. I don't think current people in the industry could envisage what the industry could look like without you. You have just been a rock for everybody. And yes, we've known each other. I think it's, I think it's 25, 6, 7, 8 years, something like that. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you, although it is during a difficult time. <laughs> Difficult time, complicated times, but I'm glad we could do this. Let's do it again. Yeah. Well, Stefan, we, we are in a difficult time, and uh, we're sheltering in place, and, and I realize I'm in my dining room in Houston, and you're in Hawaii on a golf course, but very similar, but uh, I, do, I do wish I was with you. <clears throat> but anyway, so Stefan, throughout your life, and you know, we've talked about this, you've lived through some very tragic situations. And if you could give us a little insight and share a little bit about uh, these experiences to put into perspective where we are today. Mm, Bob, yeah, interesting. It's an interesting question because I did on one call <clears throat> with somebody else say that we are living through Corona at, in first world times. <laughs> and it's actually not that bad. And by that, of course, uh, let me quickly say that I don't mean that, that the virus isn't serious, that the times aren't bad. These, these difficult times of, of stay-at-home orders and, and hundreds of thousands of people becoming sick and potentially many tens of thousands possibly passing away, of course that is all very, very serious. And, and our, our hearts and our prayers go out to anybody who, who knows somebody or who is affected. So, absolutely. Um, but at the same time, I have to say, you know, most of us are sitting at home. Yes, and I am blessed to be at my vacation home. But that aside, most of us are sitting at home with with Netflix <laughs> and and food deliveries, and you know, the food stores are still open. And yeah, we have to wear a mask and all that kind of good stuff. But but 
life pretty much still goes on fairly uninterrupted. Uninterrupted from what we were used to, yes. We've lost some of our, our creature comforts, absolutely. Um, but we're complaining in a world and an environment where we are actually very fortunate. And, and that stemmed from the fact that my dad was a diplomat and, and he was stationed in many countries across the world. And back in the 50s, I was born in the 50s, um, he was stationed in, in a place called Kenya. Sometimes people joke and say one of our previous presidents were, was born there, or at least his father was born there. But, but Kenya in the 50s uh, was a, a violent country. It wanted to become independent from its European rulers. In, in that specific case, it was England, but, but companies like Germany and France and Italy and Spain and many others, Netherlands, all owned countries in Africa. And in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, these countries became autonomous. And a lot of that uh, um, independence came violently. And, and in, in the towns and cities where we lived, Nairobi, Kenya, um, if, if you were white Anglo-Saxon, if you were Indian from India, if you were Jewish, uh, you were on the bad list. And they started just killing people with machete knives. I remember we were evac'd out very quickly, sent down to a harbor, a harbor place called Mombasa, put on a helicopter, and, and flew out to a battleship just to get us away from the imminent danger of people being killed. And, and although I was still you know, very young, my dad tells me that there were many friends and many colleagues that he knew that did not make it. I mean, that's, that's violent. Now, that's not a pandemic. Then we moved to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a, is a, was an island under British control at the point in time, just you know, close to China. And we lived there for a couple of years. And then in 80, sorry, uh, 68, 67, 68, the Hong Kong virus broke out. That was a pandemic. Most Americans don't even know about that. A million people died that year, just in that region. It never even got to America, a million, right? We're not even near that number of deaths. And look how upset we are. That, that happened in 68. That's a half a century ago. That's long ago. I lived to that. We left there. We moved then to South Africa. My dad got stationed in South Africa. So I went to high school and university. I was barely there a couple of years. And the whole apartheid, black and white violence came up. And there were the Soweto riots. People got killed, it was almost like Tiananmen Square. The police and the army moved in, people threw stones and bricks, somebody opened a machine gun. They started accidentally killing some people. People died, there was riots, the gold price collapsed, I don't know, from $300 to, I don't know, a third of that. The economy went to, you know, in a basket. We stayed at home because we were scared of being killed and mugged and raped. So I'm not trying to compare this with that. Every, every country, every, circumstance, every 9-11, Katrina, everyone is unique in its own way, and, and everyone impacts us personally and, and our families and our communities and our societies very uniquely. And therefore, we, we must be sensitive towards the, the differences of all of these. My observation I had made at the one other call is that, that life has good and life has bad. And the bad things that happen for whatever reason, there's no point in trying to blame a, a World Health Organization or a president or a mayor that you could have or you should have. Things happen. We have to, the leaders of the time, the, the mayors, you, you're a leader, I'm a leader. We all have to step up and do the best we can at those points in time and try and see how we can help society around us, our team members, power through those things. And we will power through them. This, this too has an end and it will not be far away. It, it could be four weeks, it could be five weeks, it could be six weeks. I don't want to say it doesn't matter, of course it matters. It doesn't matter if it's a month or two or three. Bob, you and your members and I and my team members, we will get through this to the other side. I have no question about it, no doubt, no doubt. I like your positive attitude for sure. <clears throat> so obviously I know the answer to this, and you know the answer to this, but how will our industry survive the coronavirus and what, what changes will you see? Our industry, I believe, Bob, is one of the most resilient, strongest, and it's because we are made up out of um, tenacious, entrepreneurial, a personality go-getters that each want to do their own thing, right? You cannot get a realtor down. I mean, he might stumble, he might have a bad day, a might bad weekend. Realtors and brokers, they get up, boy, and they are so tenacious, they will just go and fix it. <coughs> Now, yes, yeah, clearly uh, less open houses, less showing. Showings have come down a lot. And you guys in Texas have, have still the oil price on top of that, right? But, but 
basically at the end of the day, I'm not sure there'll be a, a new normal because at the moment, I don't know, showings are down, I don't know, 90%, 95%. So I don't think that that's going to become the new normal. We're not going to have 95% less showings for the rest of our lives. But yes, the technology, the, the, the sickness, the illness, the stay-at-home orders, uh, the use of more technology will gradually expedite the shifts which we are already on. It, uh, COVID is not introducing tech. We've always had tech. You know, I've been talking about tech. When did you start HJR.com, right? 30 years ago. Right, 97. Yeah, so, so maybe HAR will become even more powerful. Maybe more people will use it. But you didn't start HAR because of COVID. DocuSign wasn't created because of COVID. We've already had the technology. Yes, we'll probably be using it more and more and more as we move towards automation in a broad uh, path as we already were. So will we have a new normal? I don't know. We know what new normal is. I think we're just looking for a word to phrase it. The industry will change somewhat. We will change with it. Yes. What, what right now should members be thinking about or should be doing to prepare themselves for when we get back to more normal? Ah, that's a good question. Um, we should learn from history, but we should not build a future on history. The future is different. And, and although leaders like, like you and, and myself and, and, and other big companies, the, the, the Keller Williams and the Religies and the Remaxes and the Berkshire Hathaways and all those, all of those leaders are giving their opinion. Um, and none of us really truly know what's going to happen. Great. We can talk to each other and we can make a calculated guess. We can make an assumption. We can, we can preface something that happened in the past. What we do know for certainty is that, that the virus, the illness, the seriousness will pass. There will be a time in the hopeful, hopefully, not too distant future. We're talking weeks or months, not years. So, so maybe, maybe by June? Now, again, I, I, it's not an on-off switch, right? It's not something which somebody's just going to flick the switch tomorrow and suddenly tomorrow, we're all back to normal. Yay, we can do everything. It'll probably be a gradual process. No economic recoveries overnight, uh, no uh, change of a new business model, or even the evolution of an of a offer pad or open door or a compass or an EXP or a Redfin. None of them grew overnight. They all, they all had time to gradually uh, grow. So our return back to normal will be gradual. Um, I don't think it'll take years, but I probably think it'll take months. We will probably start going back to some of our old bad habits, unfortunately. You know how people are, Bob. I mean, we'll probably go, well, um, I can't see people not going to restaurants and drinking. Why, why would that stop, right? <laughs> We're not just drinking at home. <laughs> now, when the restaurants open again, we'll go back to restaurants. Are we going to have face masks at restaurants? Probably not. And if we do, it might last for a very short period of time until we get over that. I mean, who wants to be at a Ruth Chris with a bottle of wine with a face mask. It's not going to work. So, so we will probably go back to some normal behavior, which we as humans like, our, our comfort creatures, our creature comforts, right? But yes, I do think we will be a little bit more diligent, maybe. We might, you know, kiss and hug strangers a little less, maybe, right? Yeah. We, we, might, we might wipe down more things in public spaces. We might more carry disinfectant with us. We might be a little bit more cautious before we do certain things we might drive a little bit less. So real estate will adjust, but I don't think significantly. Let, let me ask you how you see uncertainty uh, affecting the market <clears throat> between sellers, buyers, lenders. I was talking to one of our uh, officers the other day. They represented a buyer ready to go to closing. They had sold their home, ready to buy the home. The seller had just lost his job was in the process of buying a home and decided to back out that he was afraid and certain to move forward. Now the home he was gonna buy, that it's like a domino effect. I mean, one domino falls and it may impact one, two, three, four, five other individuals. So how do you see the, and it's really uncertainty, it's fear of the unknown. Uh, Bob, uh, that's a deep question because I think that uncertainty and fear, which you also threw in there, is something which is prevalent uh, always. Uh, I think that the, the current circumstances has elevated our awareness of that. 
But I believe it's always there, and I believe we should never allow fear or uncertainty to get into our heads. I mean, yes, I do watch the news, but for as short as possible time as I can every day, because it's one of the most depressing things you can do in life, right? <laughs> because, I mean, whether you're, you're a Fox guy or a CNN guy or MSNBC guy, I mean, all of those channels can ruin your day if you look at yeah. them for longer than 60 seconds. And I understand that we... We should look to be aware of what's going on. But I am a big firm believer that fear and uncertainty is also largely in our own heads and in our own mind. That doesn't mean that somebody can't lose their job. I get that. That doesn't mean that, that if your wife is pregnant and they're foreclosing your house, that, that you don't have concern. Of course you would have concern. But, but there is uncertainty and fear that my wife could leave me. My partner, Jack, could leave me. My company could close down. I could, I could take on a client and screw the whole client up royally and do a bad job. I could put out the next trends report and everybody could say to me, it's the worst report ever. We're never going to look at it again. All of that exists. It's just not something which I consider as a high probability in my world. Because if I love my wife and I do the right things, she will stay with me. If I treat my staff well and I, my partners and I communicate and talk and we are positive and we're building a future, making a difference, why would my partners leave? And I think the same applies. The real estate market might go down 15%. And I, I'm picking a number just as a placeholder, meaning I don't think it's 50%. We're not, we're not going to go back to a 206, 207. So if it does go down 15%, don't be worried that the 15% it's going down is the 15% which you had. Make sure that the 15% going down is somebody else's 15%. There's still going to be 85% left right? Go off to that. If we go down from 6 million transactions to, I don't know, five, five and a quarter, four and three quarters, goodness gracious, four and three quarters times two is nine and a half million transaction size. Keller Williams, which is the biggest single brand in the country, only did a million transaction size. So nobody is even close. Even if you take all the Keller transactions away and all the Remax and all the Realogy, there's probably still another four million transactions left for you to go get. So Bob, the Houston guys, Go get the other transactions. Don't worry about the one or two that left. I mean, yes, they'll leave. I'm not discarding them. I'm just saying, don't fret and don't get upset and don't get scared about something which you can actually manage. You can. Typical good Stefan advice. <laughs> now, you do a lot of research and a lot of writing about new business models and I buyers and franchises and venture capital coming into the industry and companies going public. How do you see the current situation impacting these different entities? Um, clearly, uh, we are not in an ideal market circumstance to take a company public, right? I right. mean, everybody's probably seen their 401k go down with 20 or 30%. So, so to, in today's market, raising money is going to be uh, less than easy. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. There are people that were still busy with deals, still working on deals. There are companies that are already vested interest in companies, which they probably will now still fund to try and keep them afloat or alive. But yes, going public now, raising money is going to be much harder, uh, uh, mm, let's say, uh, AC, right, than BC. And that means after Corona, then before Corona, right? So before Corona, it was easy, right? Because before Corona, there was less fear and less uncertainty. Now, there's a little bit more. And yes, when, when people announce things such as we work losing money, everybody says, oh, that's the end of, of, of Compass. Oh, it's not the end of Compass. Yes, they've got a few things they have to deal with, but it's not the end of Compass by, by any stretch. So I believe that, that uh, Realogy has seen their stock price go down a lot. Are they going to close down? No way in hell. They won't close down. They've got strong leaders, Ryan Gorman and Ryan Schneider and John Payton are working to try and fix and solve those things. Remax saw their shares go a little down. Well, Adam Contes has been buying up technology companies. He's working very hard to get his technology improved. Keller uh, has felt that, although you can't see their stock price because they're a private company, clearly they would have felt a little bit of a pinch. They're still recruiting agents left, right, and center. Yes, EXP has, has uh, terminated some staff members. Stock price has gone down a little bit. It's still worth a many hundred million dollar company. Um, so these businesses, when you see Redfin terminating staff, Compass terminating staff, EXP turning staff, they, they are prudently, prudently 
making the necessary adaptions to try and retool their company so that when this market turns and turn it will, that they can be best positioned to capitalize on that. Don't see that as a show of weakness. Look at the leaders at these companies, whether it's, it's Realogy, Keller, Compass, EXP, doesn't mind. Look at that and look at that and say, oh, 15%, it's over. Look at that and say, here is a progressive, smart, apt leader that is already taking positive steps to try and make sure that his business is going to survive. And, and that's, that's what it is. Yes, public companies, more scrutiny. Private companies, a little easier. If you have a kind of an iBuyer model, probably a little difficult to do uh, open houses and show houses and have people come to houses now at the moment. Hence, that sales will probably be less. Virtual companies probably have it a little, little easier. EXP probably has a bit more benefit, right? They're virtual. So some are being benefited a little bit more than others, but I don't think that the benefit is game over. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you've just released Section 4 of the Real Estate Office. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure everybody on the, on the Zoom today knows exactly what that is. There are five parts to it. Briefly explain the Albanac and, and the different pieces and how that benefits the members. And then, and then who are the largest brokers or the largest companies in the country? I'm sorry if I confuse the members, Bob, because we do so much research. Uh, it I is know you do. <laughs> and, and every year we, I am committed <clears throat> to be the, the, the custodian, the lighthouse, the rock. T3 wants to be that organization which you can trust for the best data and the most complete data in the industry. So every year we do add more and more. So all of our, our research is annual. It gets updated every year. But if, if we last year researched 10 things, the next year we're researching 12. And then the next year, 14 and 15. So our lists do grow. And yes, the almanac uh, has many pieces. <laughs> You're right. But I'll try and make it simple for you. Let's say it's five pieces, right? There's my fingers. Five pieces, guys. Right, right. And, and we put it out over a period of five months, not to confuse you and not, not to spread it out over time, just because we're working on the other pieces. When we put up piece number one, we're still working on piece number two, three, and four. So, so piece number one comes out every year in January. And it basically is the leadership piece, the people piece. That's executives like you, Bob. It's the Bob Goldbergs. It's the, it's the head of the franchises, the head of the brokerage companies. It, it's the Tom Ferries, the Brian Buffinis. It's the Brad Inmans, right? It is any leader in our industry that we believe across any discipline of our market is in charge of, responsible for, carries the burden, is the CEO, is the chairman, is a, a C kind of a level of any significant big organization where they influence the industry. So that's, that's January. We, we traditionally know that as the SP200. And that's been coming out for seven years. We, rank up, we research about 4,000 people, people and companies. And we, from that, pick about 300. And then we whittle the list down to about 200. And then we put one, two, three, four. It's not about the ranking. It's about people knowing who are the people in the know and in the biz and in the knowledge. February... We move away from the leaders. In February, we do associations like yours. We do local associations, state associations. We do the MLSs. So we rank all 655 MLSs in the nation from big to small. We rank, we rank all these state associations, 1 to 1 to 51. And then we do uh, about 300 or 400 of the local associations. There's about 1,000 of them roughly. And we put them in order of, of membership numbers. Again, it's not about size. It's not about who's number one. It's just an encyclopedia. It's a list for all of us to know who's there and where they are so that you know who you can talk to. Then uh, in March, we move on to what we call enterprise companies. Uh, sorry, 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 tech. We do tech, we do tech in March. Enterprises is April. See, even I get confused. <laughs> so so uh, 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 d d January, February, March. March, we do the Tech 500. And that's the one that, that you just saw the other day, which came out. That's our latest, most exciting one. We look at all the tech vendors, apps, software, programs, platforms, SaaS systems. We break it up into all of the functionality of a brokerage company, back office, front office, accounting, lead, lead gen, lead management, everything an agent or a broker does. And we've come to the conclusion there's about 63, 64 categories, buckets. And then there's probably in the ballpark of 20, 30, 40 vendors in each bucket. 
So we've come up with a list of about 2,000 tech vendors, Rob, 2,000. It is so confusing that people like you and me, we don't even understand what they do. So what we did is we started putting those 2,000 into these 64 buckets to try and sort them all out. And then we said, and who are the best five or 10? We haven't ranked them yet. We've just, we've looked at management, budget, clients. We've done some client interviews. Product, is the product stable? Does it work? Uh, have they been around for a while? And we put them into, these are quality. So we came up with 550 quality technology providers in 64 buckets. And again, these lists are all free. We don't sell these lists. They're 100% free. You can go to the web today and go download tech vendors in any bucket. So don't let anybody ever come and tell you they don't know what's going on tech. It is there. Is, is it realestatealmanac.com? Yes. It, it, okay. As simple as that. Yep, you're right. Realestatealmanac.com. And Almanac, again, is just our neutral word for encyclopedia, library, Wikipedia. It's the real estate yep. Wikipedia. Uh, and then in April this month, we came out what we call the enterprise companies. Those are the big enti entity companies like you just mentioned, the public ones, um, the franchisors, the, the networks, the Realty Alliance, the leading REs, uh, the big, big organizations where the, the Berkshire Hathaways, where one company owns another company, owns another company, owns another company, which is public. We try and figure out all of those. And then next month, May, we come out with a thousand of the biggest broker companies in the nation. Whether you are then an independent broker or a franchisee, we list you all of that. So by the time we finish the month of May, we have analyzed leaders, associations, MLSs, tech companies, uh, holding companies, public companies, franchisors, networks, and brokerage companies. We have dissected just about everything. And then what we do is we put that all together in July into one compendium, one book of about 500 pages that you can keep on your table. Now, of course, all of this information is available, mobile, free of charge. But if you want a book on your table, you can actually get a book and use it as a reference guide for the future. And we'll update this every year. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, your, your research is, there's nothing to compare with it that I'm aware of. You're, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. What, what companies or models do you think will be most impacted by the coronavirus in, in a good way or a bad way, a positive or a negative? Wow. Wow. Um, I sort of knew that question was coming, but I was hoping we were going to forget to ask it. Um, I wanted to jump in really quick and just say that we did have uh, this uh, similar question from a member. Danny Frank asked, if this goes on six to nine more months, where do you see indie brokers in the real estate world still in business or fewer or more indies as well? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Thanks Danny. Trust me to throw up that one. <laughs> um, I don't want to avoid the question, so I will answer the question because I hate it when people avoid the question, but I think that it is the, the companies that are going to fail are less about the model you use rather than the management capability of the staff managing it. So I don't feel that you can say, oh, for certain EXP is going to explode because they're virtual and for certain religion is going to die because they're traditional. I don't think that that is a fair comment to make. I do believe that if you are online structured, if you have less offices, if you are more in tune with your company and a hands-on manager, if you cut any leases that you were supposed to cut or could cut, if you reduce some of your expenses, I think you will have a significantly better chance to survive. And I think you could do those things when you are a Keller Williams model or a Realogy model or an indie model or an indie model or a Redfin model or an EXP model. Now, some models like an EXP or a Redfin may already have lesser offices, so they have less to cut. Or you might say that a traditional maybe C21 or ERA or BHG might have per capita, per agent, more offices, therefore they have more burden. So maybe, maybe they have more expenses which they have to trim. But a good leader will take on the responsibility of saying, I'm going to firstly adapt by reducing my expenses wherever I possibly can. I'm going to accelerate my, my contribution to society. I am going to reach out to all of my existing clients and find out what can I do for them? How can I help them? We've offered, we've reached out to one or two of our clients and said our biggest clients, which have supported us the most, and we've said to them, for the next 60 days, what can we do pro bono for you? We're not going to give you an invoice. 
We know that you're hurting somewhere. We don't know where because you haven't told us. Clearly, it's confidential. Tell us how we can help. We even put out as T3, we put out Ask T3, and we said we will give free consulting advice to the first 100 brokerage companies that ask us. Just go to askt3.com, free over the phone. Tell us what you want and we'll help you. Now, that's obviously not going to make us money, but we're trying to help our customers. So if a broker or an agent goes back to their customers, their market, their society, their neighborhood, their community and say, how can I help? How can I step up? If we do the right things, I think your brokerage will survive. If you're an independent, yes, it might require a little bit more heavy lifting, but you also have the benefit that you know thy neighbor, you know thy community, you are right there, right? So Realogy might have more resources, but they also a little bit more removed. So they have to give whatever they do, they have to do through their franchisors, through their franchisees down to the local agents. Local agents can do it themselves. Step up, show your community, show your agents, show your, your clients that, that you're not scared, you're not uncertain, you're standing shoulder by shoulder with them and you will be with them there through the whole time. Yes, you're gonna take a hit. T360 is gonna take a hit. We will have a financial hit and it's gonna hurt but we will power through that. So fine is as a, as a kind of a follow-up on that, because you mentioned uh, office space, for example, uh, how some brokers have less, some have maybe more. What, what do you think will be the most significant impacts in 2020? And let, let me start with the, the office space. I've been in brokerages all over the country, some beautiful offices, gorgeous offices, and everything you can want except no agents. I mean, you, you can't, basically find an agent. And I'm thinking, personally, I have bought and sold a lot of real estate since the early 70s. And never once have I been in a broker's office other than to speak to their agents. I've never been in there for a business transaction because the agent has always come to my house 100% of the time. So I'm just wondering, do you think that will be a casualty of this office space, for example? Not, not all, but I mean a greater reduction, I'll say. Yes, Bob, I, I, I do, I do. But if we look at the research we've been doing the last 20, 30 years, office space per agent or office space per office has already been on the decline. You're right, back, back in 50s, 60s, 70s, people got offices in every zip code because the internet did not exist because mobile phones weren't that common available and walking to your neighborhood grocer and butcher and candlestick maker and realtor was this how it was done right and right over time when we, we we moved from independent brokers more to kind of franchising across the country and bigger brokerage companies we built it we built bigger monoceums and and buildings and 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 uh we, we we bought the buildings and put our names on them right and and that was a phase which we went through i think that that companies like keller already has less market centers than what maybe a century 21 has offices Century 21, which dates back to 1972 when it was founded, was founded when corner offices was very prevalent. Now, Century 21 has clearly reduced its office count, no question about it, but it still has more offices than Keller is. Keller was only formed in the 80s, about 20 years later, and they formed with a different concept, and they have less offices than a company like, like uh, Century, which, which is maybe two decades older. But then again, Redfin, started two decades after Keller has less offices than Keller does. And then EXP, which was started a decade after Redfin, has less offices than Redfin has. Yeah. So we have been on a path towards lesser offices, more technology usage, more online uh, virtual tools uh, to make the transaction equally <clears throat> easy. I do think that many brokers are regrettably stubborn or stubbornly holding on, holding on to their offices because they believe that they will lose their agents. Um, and they will tell you that they will lose their agents if they were to close the offices. Now, closing offices, of course, is an extreme. Maybe if you have 20 or 30,000 square feet, maybe you cut that in half. And maybe in two or three years yeah. time, you cut it in half again. Maybe two or three years time, you cut it in half again. People should not argue that when you don't like black, that the only solution is white. The, 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 the life is not extremes. We don't have to go from all the way here to all the way here. This, I know 50 shades of gray in between people. Come on, let's wake up to this, right? So we can go step by step. 
having less offices is better. That does not mean no offices. It means less offices. We, you and I, the other day, kind of went back and forth, debated, you know, how life is going to change after that, based upon what we're seeing. And so let, let's let's take a few of these and talk about these. Sixty percent of food consumed in New York last year was at a restaurant. Today, people are cooking at home. They're ordering in food from Favor or Uber Eats. Do you think when this is over, people will go back to 60% dining in a restaurant? Well, I think, I think many husbands are now finding out that their wives can or cannot cook maybe, right? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> or that there's nothing, there's nothing in the pantry uh, but toilet paper. <laughs> uh, Bob, I don't know. I'm not a restauranteur or an expert. I've never tracked that, so I don't know. So this is a personal opinion. Well, I, I can't wait to get back to restaurants. Myself. I, I, I'm counting I, the days. I do think that restaurants will be back in business in the not foreseeable future. Now, will the number of restaurants be down? I have no doubt it will be down because some of them probably have now closed and got, got hurt and maybe lost the business regrettably. And some of them might just be at an age of retirement where they just, they don't want to start this all over again. But if we take chains that we respect or big chains or, or companies that are well-run restaurants, restaurants which you love to dine at, I love to go to Ruth Chris, one of my favorite steakhouses. I don't think Ruth Chris is closing down. I, right. I am 100% certain that before the year is out, you and I will go to dinner at Ruth Chris and we'll have a glass of wine. Yeah. And, and it's not because we're going to make a point or take a bet. It's just going to be because at some stage, normality will return. And at some stage, now, instead of going, and I don't know how many times the average person dines out, but if we just use an example, maybe if the average per person before Corona went to a restaurant once a week, so let's say it was four times a month just as a placeholder, yes, maybe post-Corona, after Corona, maybe it's three times a month. All right, so, just, just, just as an aside, <clears throat> Stefan's mentioned Ruth Chris now two or three times. He is a steak and potato guy all the way, right? Yeah. You like a filet every night, correct? I do. I do. I'm, a, I'm, a very, I'm a very stable, very dependable guy. You can take me to the bank. Yep. If I <laughs> say people, something, it will happen. People now more than ever are watching Netflix and Amazon Prime because they can't, the movies are closed. Do you think they'll go back to the movie theaters? Uh, I do think they will go back to movie theaters, but we do know that people don't go to the movie theater to watch a movie, right? They go to the movie theater for the experience, right? For, for the date, for the evening out, for, for yeah. getting out of the house. People will still want, my, my, my son is still going to say, here, have your grandbaby for the night because my wife and I are going right. to go right. to the movie, right? So right. they will still go. Now, if you just want to watch a movie, there's nothing like the comfort of your home. I mean, whether right. you're in bed or in a sofa and it's Netflix and you can fall asleep on the couch next to your loved one. I mean, that's awesome. But it's pretty cool to, to dress up and take your wife or a loved one uh, or a husband to, to dinner and, and then go watch a movie. So I yeah. think movie numbers will be down, but I don't think that movies will as a regal entertainment. And Edward Theatres is not closing right. down. They might close a movie theater down where the numbers were dwindling in any event. Oh, I think right. crises has put bad management out of business and it opens the door for opportunity for people who would like to seize it. All right, another topic, Instacart is hiring 300,000 full-time workers to deliver groceries to your home. Do you think people will go back to the grocery store once it's over? Do you think they'll continue to use Instacart or Favorite? H-E-B just bought Favorite. I think anything that increases the creature comforts which we as society likes is going to continue to grow. We already saw a growth of things like, like Uber Eats. That was even pre uh, right. Uh, right. the decline. So, so now the fact that Instacart is growing, that's just part of society evolving convenient. My wife hates shopping at a grocery store. Yeah. It's not because of Corona. She has hated it forever. And we've been married. We'll be married this year for 40 years. She's never loved it for 40 years, right? She says it's one of those bad things like washing and ironing and going to the grocery store, right? <laughs> she loves going to a, a store to go buy a dress. That's it, Instacart has made it so easy. It's yeah. just... It is so now. Amazon's hiring a hundred thousand new workers to deliver product. 
Do you think people will still do that or you think they'll go to the mall and find a parking place and try to find a store and Amazon sends me every year a note to say thank you for shopping with them. Last year I see I did 125 separate purchases on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> now one purchase could have had many items, but there was 125. I mean, I'm embarrassed. That's twice a week. Right? Which means that I'm addicted. I'm officially addicted to Amazon. So so um and that was before Corona. During Corona, I'm probably not going up to three times a week, right? Why? Because it's so convenient. I could be talking to you. And while we're talking, you say to me something which you say, Stefan, you know, you should really buy a Swanepoel Trends Report. And I think that's a great idea. And what do I do? I multitask here, open up the screen, go to Amazon, order the item as we all, I mean, who does not have Amazon Prime? It's yeah. All right. I got, I got a couple of more. Let's hit them real quick. Quick answer. Okay. okay. People are meeting online using Zoom. Yesterday, we had a meeting using Zoom with Zaki and Sean. We had 3,100 members watch it. Wow. That, that's, that would have, in person, would have been an impossibility, but it never happened in a million years. So do you see post-virus items like Zoom becoming the new way to communicate, to uh, educate, inform? I think that online communication, effective systems, such as Zoom or Cisco systems or WebEx, or any of those communication platforms will be strong. They will grow. I think we will use them more. But I will tell you, put a good event together. HAR, put a good event together. Me, put T3 Summit together. The people will come again. The people yeah. will like. People still want that human interaction. We are not going to be born in a hospital and stay in front of our Zoom computer for the rest of our lives so we can die in front of a, a, a hospital again. We will want to get out in between. But yes, yeah, there, there, there's different, you know, one works for one, work, one works for another. Okay, last one. Millions of employees no longer have long commutes. They're working from home. Well, they want to return to the hour drive to the office. <laughs> no. that's, 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 that's a big... Yeah. That's a big question out there. Yeah. I mean, uh, T3, T36 is corporate offices in Southern California. I have the 405 and the 5 freeway to deal with. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. So I think any, any employee that could work either one day a week from office or two days a week from office or zoom into a call from time to time or reduce wasted travel time, whether that's on American Airlines or Delta or a car or an Uber, wasted time in today's society is bad. Bad. Yeah. I you know, we, we we deal with a lot of employees, companies we work with, Realtor.com and Zillow and CoreLogic and all the, I mean, a lot of them nationwide. All of the employees we work with, not one of them goes to the office. Every single one of them, because they're all over the country and they all work from home. And I never realized how it would work till we, till we saw it firsthand. But it, it's, it's a... It's really an interesting concept. Now, before Christina just wanted to get into questions, before we do, explain briefly, Stefan, briefly, <laughs> your operation. Now, you've got the T3 conference, you've got the trends reports, you've got the real estate Albanac, you've got industry, all types of industry consulting, the danger report you did for NAR, you're a sought after national speaker. We've used you many times and you're a best-selling author. So yeah, I've, I've kind of laid the groundwork, but <laughs> it, it's sure. an amazing operation you put together. Just an amazing operation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Briefly, um, we are a management consulting company, which would be, if you want to compare it to something outside of our industry that you might be aware of, something like a McKinsey, a Boston Consulting, maybe even a Price Waterhouse or a Deloitte, although they are largely more known as accounting companies, which we are not. We see ourselves as a, um, a management consulting company that will come in and help any broker, independent franchisee, team leader, organization, franchise, a technology company vendor with anything that you may need help on. If you want to take your company public and you don't have the time or the resources, if you want to expand into another state, if you want to acquire another company, if you want to train your successor, if you want to find your successor, if your company is not profitable, if you want to make it profitable, if you want to redo your business plan because you're stuck in a rut, 
if you want to scale down your business, if you want to scale up your business, it, you may have the staff at the moment, but they may be busy with their daily jobs. We don't come in to take over your staff's jobs. That's not the point. We might come in to support your staff and help with a new initiative, maybe for a three, six, nine, 12 month period and kickstart a project, get a project off the ground. Your staff may be running something in tandem. We come in almost as your SEAL team. So if you said to me, I need to have, I'm not just using the government as an example. If, I, if you want Osama bin Laden taken out in real estate, I'm your guy, right? So if you need a task done, if you want a project done, we, are help, we help at any given time, probably about 150 companies across the country at any given time. And they range from franchisors, independent brokerage companies, franchisees, uh, 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 associations, state and local. I think uh, MLSs, I think we're at the moment helping about 28 MLSs, mergers, consolidations, finding new leaders, finding new executives, training them, helping them do things that make them a better organization. Most companies have staff which do their day job and their day job doesn't always allow enough bandwidth to evolve or grow or change or adapt or to run multiple jobs at the same time. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let, let me make a comment. Uh, Ross Crew just posted a, a note that she just surveyed 3,500 members <clears throat> and 34% said they plan to work from home much more often after the COVID-19 is over. Is there a question yeah, there? Or is that... you, you probably have some questions for Stefan, I'm sure. Yes, uh, we have had some questions coming through. I do want to share one other comment we got from Jordan, who is watching. Um, she said that she's loving taking the CE classes online through HAR. Um, she does like the idea of selling in-person tickets and Zoom tickets to the same event. So offering virtual options and <laughs> personal options. <laughs> um, so one of the first questions we got was from Linda. Um, she asked, which will impact our market the most, COVID-19 or the drop in oil prices today? Wow, wow. Bob, that's, I mean, I, I can take a shot at that, but that sounds like a Texas question. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to have Ted Jones. When, when is he speaking? He's the perfect person for that. April 30th, yes. April 30th, yeah. We want to be sure and hear Ted. Uh, 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 Linda, um, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer that, but I would say that it sounds like you guys are getting hit twice here. It sounds like a double whammy to me. It's almost like New York. Um, the, a significant drop in the price of any any key material, be, be it oil or gold or, or, or grain or, or pork or anything on which a certain region is significantly dependent on, will clearly um, exasperate and worsen the situation which you have. So I would think if both COVID-19 and a drop in the, in the oil price remain in place for an extended period of time, Texas is going to have a very very bleak future for the immediate short term. If COVID washes over, we get back to normal quickly, and the world leaders are able to get the gold, or the oil price back in the right direction, I think you will power through it. So it's probably not which one's worse, it's which one's going to recover first, and how strong will the recovery be of that? Okay, very good. Um, Shirley asked, will this hiatus from clients not working or in hiatus hurt credit requirements for home buyers? Ooh, interesting question. Uh, I saw my credit score drop as well. Um, I think if, if the changes are creating a new normal and there's a, a readjustment in the formulas or calculation, or the formulas cannot take into consideration the fact that you did or did not buy, that you have now more debt than you had before, then theoretically it might, yours might drop, like mine drop a little bit, but it might drop across the board. And I think that a new lender who wants to get back in the market when the market is hot again, is going to probably be aware that that adjustment was not a normal adjustment. It was across the board adjustment. And they might allow for a little bit of, of flexiness on that, I would suspect. Uh, I saw the drop in mine, but it dropped from a level which was already, in my opinion, good to still good. It's probably not gonna ha have any impact on me whatsoever. Although when I looked at the number, I said, you know, what the hell, what's going on here? <laughs> Christina, I would I would recommend in pre-buyers days, <clears throat> what's the interest rate was a big deal. 
Today, it's what lender will get it closed when you want to be, be get it closed. And, you know, one lender just went up on their credit score requirements <clears throat> and requiring 20% down. Another one said, we're not going to do jumbo loans anymore. These are big lenders. So we're seeing every day new guidelines, new changes in the mortgage industry. So that, that's a key deal. Who will get my loan closed? Not so much what will it cost. Okay. Uh, Shad is asking, what are your thoughts on the mortgage industry? I just said. <laughs> any any other thoughts? <laughs> uh, the, the, <clears throat> the answer I would provide is to say that if you look at the stock price of some of the large financial institutions that we all recognize, like the Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, uh, they've already been hammered, right? The stock prices have dropped a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking that it might be a good time to buy some long-term stocks in banking. I, because I don't think that you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo will close down. But clearly that in a time of uncertainty, as you said, Bob, and fear, they are going to either stop doing certain lending, they're going to see how the government's going to help them, they're going to wait and see when the market returns and who returns and how it returns. So I think they will be cautioned for a period of time, but I have no doubt that they will be back in the market in the not too distant future, as sure, as soon as things start normalizing. And as you said, Bob, different institutions might enter the market in different zip codes with different yeah. products and different styles. And we'll maybe have to shop around a little bit more, but I am pretty sure they'll be back in the market with mortgages in the not too distant future on a wider basis. They're just being cautious because if your stock price dropped with 40 to 60%, you're scared. Yeah. Very good. Um, Monsoor asked a question actually about social media. Um, <laughs> Instagram and Snapchat have become very prevalent in the last couple of years, but there hasn't been much return from them statistically. Is that something that might be a norm after COVID-19? Do you have any thoughts on that, Stefan? No. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I even know what the question is actually. Um, I know, I don't think I can answer that. Give me, give me the question. Christine is our, is our social media guru, so you might have an opinion. I guess that he's mostly asking um, if social media is going to be something that maybe we lean on more heavily after COVID-19, since we are having to use it so much now. Um, my thought is absolutely. There's more people at home trying to learn these platforms that maybe have never used them before. I think you're just going to see people continue to use them after COVID-19. So I think that I think that's a that's a that's a good answer. I think it's a good answer. I mean, many of the platforms you mentioned a few there, um, uh, Instagram, but but I mean many of the other platforms, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, even even Twitter to a different kind of level, Snapchat, uh, um, WeChat. Many of those platforms were already very large before the time, and yes, they were a little bit more generationally used than maybe across all generations equally. Uh, probably some generational age groups that did not use it as prevalently probably have now more, as you said, maybe more have started using it because of circumstances. Um, I think it will be more widely used, but I think it's really being used by literally billions of people. And I think if it's being used by a few hundred million people more, I don't think it's going to significantly change it. I do think that it is a tool that will stay. I think it is a tool that is here. And I think it is part of the new normal, but I think it was part of the new normal before BPC. Before Corona was part of the new normal, maybe only some people will get it that it's now the new normal. But it's been the new normal for a couple of years. <laughs> Last week, uh, Christina, I posted a tweet and Stefan contacted me and he said, obviously you need a little help. I'd be willing to help you out if you would like my advice. <laughs> so he's always helping. Very good. Well, love you, man. well, any social media platform, you can just post something and then you can learn how to use the platform yeah. to its fullest opportunity by, yeah. by using that, the hashtags or the ad symbols or, the, or tying it in and getting the, the header right and keeping the copy low and getting the visual in there and getting the links in. And there's a, there's a normal way to do it. And then there's a, well, I can get 10, 10 times bigger bang for my buck if I did this instead yeah. of that. Very good. Um... 
Let's see. Oh, so the opposite question here, Irene's asking, what about the opposite, an increased use of calling, not just text or email, and sending personal cards and mail? I think that there will be people that will use those as standout techniques because generally people don't use that as often as they did many, many decades ago. I like it. I mean, I will often, I probably will do 300 or 400 thank you cards in a year. And I am very technology savvy. I mean, I have 150,000 friends, fans, and followers on my four social media accounts. So I love social media, but I still do 300 cards a year because there are to certain people I know that if I send to a certain age group, age group or a certain person or a certain type of person a tweet, he's probably not even going to see it. <laughs> it might hit his machine, but he's not even in tune to it. Where if I send him a thank you card, I know he will get it. But I still send a factor of 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 more social media activities than old school activities. But I keep the old school activities. Uh, Bob and I like to text. Well, I think Bob probably texts with many people, but... I, on the strangest of times, Bob and I will text each other. It might be New Year's Eve, five minutes before 12 o'clock, irrespective of where Bob is or I am, we will text each other. Maybe we text more people, but we would do that because he gets the text. And when, when I send it to him or he sends it to me, we both tend to get it, respond to it. He takes a picture of Susie. I take a picture of Ira. We send it to each other. So it feels like we're connecting, right? And I think that's the point. If I can connect with Jack Miller, via Instagram, then I will use Instagram with Jack. But I will not get, con I will not connect with Bob Hale on Instagram. It won't work, right? <laughs> text works. So you use the platform that allows you to have the best possible relationship you can with the other person. Yeah. I would use every platform I can get, every single one. That's a great, that's a great answer. So I don't see any other questions coming in. Just a lot of thank yous for this wonderful information. Uh, Bob, do you have anything else that you wanted to? Yeah, I was just going to ask uh, Stefan if you have any final thoughts for the audience or any uh, that, you, that we didn't cover that you'd like to, to share. Well, firstly, uh, thank you very much for the invite to this event. I can see on your calendar at the bottom of the page you've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to call. So, so good job, F fantastic job. Thank you very much for the in invite. Uh, I am thankful for our friendship and I am impressed with what you and your HAR team have done over the last, what I am aware of, three decades for the people in Houston. You are, you are a, a model, a model of a man and a model of an association. The community, I am sure, loves you very, very much. What should well, thank you thanks for being with us, Stefan. We really one appreciate it. One question that I missed from Melanie, I'm sorry. Um, best way to educate clients on how to use technology. Wow, best way to educate clients on technology is find out what medium they are the most comfortable in and use the most frequent, whether it is the telephone or it is social or it is email or it is text or it is a piece of paper. Find out what platform they instinctively uh, give preference to, which one do they, do they use a lot. Um, and then give them the answers you would like them to be aware of in that platform, through that platform. Make sure that you are short, concise, to the point, uh, and try and reinforce what you would like to reinforce without selling. Yeah. Share knowledge, share information from the heart without people feeling that they have to go wash themselves afterwards because they just dealt with the second car salesperson. Step away from your sales mode and give them what you think they need and they will love you and come back. Yes, great, great advice. Okay, so I think that is it, but I do see a, a comment from Terry saying she's loving these Zoom CE classes. She'd love to see more. You can see more. If you go to har.com slash webinars, we have some scheduled every week through the end of the month and we are adding some in May as well. Um, so go check those out. We have three, I believe, scheduled for next week. Uh, as Bob mentioned, we have Ted Jones, uh, Chief Economist for Stuart Title, coming on later this month. So go sign up for them. And I see uh, Jordan said she signed up for about 75% of them. So that's great. <laughs> uh, thank you, Stefan and Bob, for your time. And thank you to all of our members who, who tuned in today. Again, this was recorded. So we will send this to you uh, after the session is over. Thank you again. And we hope everyone has a great day. Bye-bye.